from a very young age, I realized that the things I liked to do didn't cost much money. That is a very powerful thing to realize in your 20s. And it freed me from the chase at a very young age. The other thing is, um, the way I'm wired is, I like to be working towards being world-class at whatever I'm doing. It was mid-December in 2022, and I had been thinking about bringing back the podcast, but I still hadn't taken any action toward it or set a deadline for myself to relaunch. There was always some sort of excuse to keep putting it off, but that was about to change. I was listening to one of the podcasts that I consistently listen to, which is the Rich Roll podcast. And on there was a guest that I had never heard of, Gordo Byrne. And I found myself just enthralled with his story and sat there feeling like, wow, this is a story that I can relate to. And more importantly, this is somebody that I would love to be able to have a conversation with and learn from him. There was just something about his story and the way that he exemplified this courage to do whatever it takes to build a meaningful life. And I just really connected with that. And so I finished the episode. I posted maybe one of his quotes to Twitter and something about that story. And a little while after that, Gordo responded. First off, I did not expect that from him at all. He was just on one of the biggest podcasts. And so I never, ever expected a response, but he did. And without even thinking about it, I threw out the idea of having him on my podcast, the podcast that I hadn't recorded in over a year or so at that point. All I knew was Gordo was the type of story that I wanted to be able to have on the podcast. And so I just decided I have to ask. And within a couple direct messages and exchanges together, there I was locked in with a date for me to record this interview with Gordo. And that was all it took. I finally had my reason to get the show going again. So thank you, Gordo. Now, Gordo's story is one of navigating life's transitions. It's a story of letting go. It's a story of sacrifice. It's a story of investing our time wisely. And it's a story of an elite athlete who has given the effort of a champion to his family and not just his training. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Gordo Byrne called A Training Plan for Life, Mastering Family, Health, and Time. Where was your life heading early on before people knew you as Gordo the athlete? Yeah, so, I mean, I was uh, I was tracking great in my firm. So I, I got hired as an associate in a private equity firm, uh, totally bottom of the heap. Uh, just as a summer uh, intern. So they gave me a shot. And I was very fortunate that I came into a group that was six partners, including the managing partner, as well as one associate. So it was top heavy. And I just love to work. And I, I fit in with all the personalities. And they accepted me and my quirks. And they gave me a ton of work. And I dove right into that. And this is in London in the UK. And it, it just, it was a really good time for me. And worked like crazy, did that for about four years. Ended up getting promoted out to Asia and stuck with that for about six more years. So over the first 10 years out of college, I managed to get myself up to the point where I was a partner in an international private equity firm. So on the face of it, very successful. And, you know, it was, it was exactly the kind of path that one might choose for oneself. I enjoyed the work. I was good at what I did. I made great money from doing that. But inside, there was really something missing. I'd grown up in Vancouver, uh, very much an outdoor life as a camp counselor in the Pacific Northwest really connecting with the ocean and the forests and everything. And there was none of that out in Asia and Hong Kong. I mean, I did, I did ultra running in Hong Kong and we, we could run around in the, there's actually a lot of parkland in Hong Kong, but there's also a lot of pollution that goes with it. And ultimately the pollution kind of drove me out of there. I, I wasn't all that happy. 
I went through a divorce about one or two years before I decided to take a leave of absence and, and, and change my life. So I guess the main driver of change in that case was two things. One, it was the divorce in terms of my, my personal life. The rug got pulled out from under it. So my five-year plan in my mind disappeared almost overnight. Mm -hmm. So I had this vision of how I was going to take my life. I was going to come across to the Bay Area, end up working over there. My wife and I were going to move over, and, and that was going to be my next region or my next transition. And it's like, well, that's not going to happen. So I'm sitting on the couch, and I'm kind of just had one of those moments where I'm like, you know what? I'm good at what I do, but this is it. I've, I've, this, is all, this is all my life is going to be, I, I, and I don't really want that. I want a different kind of life. So I had found myself in a situation mm. where it wasn't I, – I, I think I, I had felt that despite the money, I was going to be wasting my time. That's worth just kind of stopping there for a second. And despite the money, you felt like you were going to waste time. Yeah. What was going through your head to say, like, it's worth letting this go for time? The best part of my life wasn't my work. So, uh, you know, one of the things I tell people is take a look at where you're spending your time and take a look at where you're feeling rewarded. So if you take mm -hmm. that time inventory and it's almost like a joy inventory or you pay attention to, you know, what are the situations where I'm going to laugh out loud? Well, you know, where am I having fun in my life? So that was all happening when I was not in the office, when I was training. And training was a small piece of my life, even doing a lot of training. It was, you know, a couple hours a day. But the other eight to 12 hours a day was my job. I was really just sitting there doing my work, passing time until I could get out of the office to go do what I really wanted to do. And, and I had saved money along the 10 years and I knew, and, and I had a lot of good contacts in the firm and I knew I could leave and maybe I wasn't going to come back at the same level, but I'd be able to get back in at some level uh, if I took a break. And at first I just took a two month break. My, my boss thought, I, you know, it's pretty, I guess it's, I guess it's normal, you know, you get divorced. You look at everything. And my boss said, you know what? We'll give him a couple months. He'll, he'll come back. It'll be good. <laughs> he'll get his head back on, right? He'll, exactly. he'll come back thinking straight. <laughs> he'll, he'll, he'll come back in. It'll be great. We'll just go forward. So I go away for two months, train, do an Ironman, have a great time. Best, one of the best summers of my life. And I come back and I'm like, yeah, this is the same. I'm going to take a break. And I, my, I, instead of just quitting, which can create issues, I, I just, we, we agreed I'd take a year off, do my thing, and then we'd revisit it. Gordo's crossroad reminds me of another choice. This one comes from Greek mythology, and that's the choice of Hercules. And the story goes like this, that young Hercules is walking down a path. He comes to a fork in the road where he sat down to contemplate his future, sort of like Gordo's facing an opportunity to decide which path to go. Hercules found himself not sure which way to choose. Hercules' choices are presented to him from two mysterious goddesses. The first was called Kakaia. And she was beautiful, she was alluring, she promised him that if he follows her path, it's a pleasant life, it's a life of ease, and a shortcut to happiness. He was promised that on this path, he'd avoid hardships, he'd live like a king, and have a life of luxury beyond anything he could imagine. Sort of like Gordo's life as a partner in the firm. After a while, Hercules is approached by a second goddess, Arati. Picture more of a modest, but natural beauty. She wasn't boastful, and she didn't promise a path like Kakio. Instead, she warned him that if he followed her path, life would be more difficult, and it's gonna require a great deal of hard work, and basically she told him, you're going to suffer. So instead of living like a king, he's gonna walk the earth in rags, and she said that this path, even though it's harder, it is the path to true fulfillment, but it's going to require facing adversity, and it's going to require self-discipline, and he's going to have to overcome great obstacles. And as the story goes, Hercules chooses the heroic path of Arati, 
and his life was not easy. He endured many trials, he completed many daunting tasks, even betrayed by his jealous wife. But the reward for his suffering was that Zeus promised that he would live forever among the gods at Mount Olympus. Now don't worry, Gordo's story is not a story of being betrayed by a jealous wife or even being a god. Although I will say that there's something in his story here that he accomplishes that to the normal human is going to seem very godlike. But Gordo's story is one where, like Hercules and the choice that he had to make, Gordo had to have the courage to choose a harder path, but the path that he believed was the right one. And that idea of revisiting that partnership at the firm, well, that never happened. And Gordo was off to pursue being a triathlete. This also wouldn't be the last time he faced a decision crossroad like this. I went to Australia and then I went to New Zealand. And, and New Zealand is very much a, the South Island in New Zealand is very much a concentrated Canada. Felt very at home there. Got in with a great group of people that had similar interests. And so we, uh, we kind of built a life there mm. down in New Zealand. And, uh, and then it was, it was great. I had this home base in Christchurch. And during the northern summer, I could go anywhere I wanted. I could go do a work project, a consulting project. I, I, you know, one year I went to the Bay Area, you know, fulfilled that dream. But I was there doing triathlon. I wasn't there doing private equity, which is what I expected to be doing. <laughs> And then I, I went to Colorado, uh, you know, one year. And so I, I moved around, visited friends, visited with athletes, went to, went to races. And it, it was a great period of my life. And uh, ultimately, on one of those summers, I met my wife. And then we got married. And then that was another transition. Although at first, for the first, we had three years where we would travel and race together and train together. And I would have different home bases depending on what was going on in my consulting career. And if I wasn't consulting at the time, we would be down in the Southern Hemisphere in the winter, uh, either New Zealand or Australia. And it was a great mm. period for us. And then our, our daughter arrived. And at first, I just kept doing the same thing. Um, and the, my life stayed very much the same. But as the baby became a toddler became a preschooler, and then the rest of our kids arrived, it became clear to me that once again, I was at a transition point. And it's, uh, it's, I guess in one case, it was the pain of the divorce. And in this other case, it was the challenge of having these young kids around and really having mm. no skills to deal with them, none. Um, my prior life hadn't prepared me for fatherhood. And having to upskill on that and then making a decision, well, it's probably, you know, I really didn't want to get divorced again. And I was sort of willing to do whatever it I took. Think everybody, I think everybody who's been divorced <laughs> can feel those sentiments right now when you say that. I know I can. I'm like, yeah, I really don't want to get divorced again. I've been slow getting back in it because I'm like, look, next time this one's sticking. <laughs> well, and that was, you know, over those years where I was training, that's really where I was putting a lot of my physical energy is, you know, I, I had no desire to be in any relationship. And, and honestly, I, I didn't have much to offer even. I, I was mm. so just focused on, I'm going to sort myself out. I had a lot of things to work through, you know, my role in the divorce, my part in creating the failure of that relationship. I, you know, first I had to be able to see it. And then I had to address it. And it takes time. Uh, to, you know, you got to get you got to get out of the, the heat of the actual divorce and get, get some perspective on that. And and I just and I decided, look, I'm going to do what whatever it takes. I'm going to I'm going to do whatever it takes to be to make this marriage work. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes that's not enough. You know, you need two people with that attitude to actually have a successful relationship. Um, but I was committed, you know, my my wife's a lot easier going than me. So it's not as big a stretch for her. So the, so the, so what we did, I, I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to change. Uh, you know, I, I gotta, and I'm big on time. So obviously the, the racing was a big time uh, commitment because of my approach of trying to be the very best athlete I could be. And so I took the racing off the table 
And what I thought I was doing was I thought I was just taking it off the table for a year. But mm -hmm. what that did was that created a lot of time for me. It brought time back, particularly time on the weekends and particularly non-family travels, you, you know, because the race, there would be the training camps and all these other things. And then just yeah. I gradually phased all that out. All that time came back to me and it all went right back out again to the family. So it was a shift of time. So similar to when I went, uh, left the corporate world, I shifted that time into athletics. Now I'm shifting the time into family. And what I thought was going to be one or two years actually ended up being about a decade, um, just the way it played out. It's important to put into perspective what Gordo is actually letting go of. This isn't just some weekend warrior runner. But before we talk about that, Let's first make sure everybody knows what a triathlon is. I don't want to assume anything. And so let's clear that up. A triathlon is a race where you swim, bike, and run. Now, the distances can all vary, but Gordo was mostly training for an Ironman distance, which is a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, followed by a marathon. And yes, that happens in the same day. Gordo had been training with some of the top triathletes at the time and he was an elite amateur in the sport fairly quickly became that and if that distance that i just described wasn't enough gordo decides at some point to start training for an even longer distance race called the ultraman now ultraman is a three-day race that covers a total of 320 miles you have day one where you swim 6.2 miles and then you bike 90 miles. Day two, you bike 172 miles. And then day three, you run a 52.4 mile ultra marathon. Yes, you heard me correct. <laughs> and Gordo decided that in 2002, he was going to race it. Day one, Gordo comes out of the water and he's in first place. He has a great ride on the bike. He finishes day one, first place overall. Day two, Gordo wins that day as well. All he has left is a 52.4 mile ultra marathon. Yes, I said all he has left. Now, hopefully you're seeing where this is going. And yes, Gordo won the Ultraman race in 2002. So I say all that and give you some perspective because when Gordo talks about stepping away from the sport, you're hearing from a man who was one of the fastest 40-something-year-old elite amateurs at the time. He was the winner of one of the hardest endurance races, and he had a lot of great momentum going for him in his life in the sport. He wasn't walking away at his low point or after he had failed. What I respect so much about Gordo is that ability to walk away from something good in pursuit of something that he believed will be greater and more meaningful for his life. And when I first heard that, and he shared that in his story, that is what resonated with me the most. And so I was really curious to hear how Gordo felt when he transitioned from being this elite athlete to now focusing on raising a family. And so it was a much longer process than I expected. And it was kind of delayed a bit by the pandemic because the kids had I, I tell people, you know, you really just need to get to the point where your youngest kid is about six years old. And then you get these shifts as they upscale themselves. And with three kids, by the time our youngest was six, we, uh, we could leave our oldest kind of keeping an eye on the situation. And we weren't worried. I mean, you know, when they're little, you're just worried they're going to just randomly kill themselves somehow. And you got to keep, <laughs> keep an eye on them, you know, because they just get these bad ideas. And, and yeah, even falling off the couch is a threat to their life at that point, right? Yeah, and it's, and it's not even, and the, it's not even, you know, the, the hurting themselves. The other thing is they want to engage with you. Yeah, absolutely. And I work at home and having these kids that constantly want to engage with you, if you don't accept the engagement, you can be there, but be distant. You, you know, your, your presence can actually be almost, it's not harming the kid, but you're, you're actually kind of hurting them because they're like, well, dad's never going to pay attention to me. What you hit on was your presence in the room isn't the same as being present in their life, right? Yeah. And we, something that I would recommend to people if they, uh, 
is carve out time in the sense of I, I did a lot of one on one. I mean, even a, a hike, but I did a lot of one on one trips. And if you have multiple kids, something that was really helpful, uh, oftentimes the firstborn is a little more, um, I don't know, domineering is not the right word, but maybe dominant. And you sure. have the, the firstborn is wanting to dominate because they're bigger, more skilled, the, the time with the mother. So something that I did that worked great for everybody in the family was I would do one-on-one -on -one trips with our oldest and just go away mm -hmm. for a night or do something with her during the day so my wife could actually get to know the younger kids and, and nurture them when they were little. And so that was that was something that worked really well for our family. Yeah. So I did mainly one on one trips. We didn't. One of the things I found, you know, people have this idea that it's going to be great if we can all get out of our routine and go somewhere together and it's going to be great. Well, it's not going to be great in my experience. It wasn't great for me. I'm like, everybody's seeing the worst side of me. I'm exhausted. <laughs> It's, and then on top of it, it's costing me money. And, and it's like, this is not fun. And We're so paying what I, now for the frustration, right? Yeah. It's like, it's like, and I'm paying for this. I was like, this doesn't make sense. And so we, 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 I, I backed it up and I was, I was sort of like, well, what would make sense? Well, one-on-one -on -one trips. So I would, I would take a, a kid away and we would have a great time and we would get to know each other and we would do that. And, and that was a lot more enjoyable. And the other thing was we looked at the cost of like doing a trip if we brought all three kids along and we live in a college town. It was a lot easier just for us as a couple even to have a, an evening off or, or, a, or a night off and bring in somebody to help with the kids. That was a much more effective use of our family budget so that we could get a, a bit of a reset from the chaos that ensues at bedtime every night. And and yeah. my wife and I would also alternate um, with who put the kids to bed and to give the other parent a, a bit of a break so that you don't get totally burnt out. Because I think it's daunting, you know, when you're dealing with, so what do we have? At one point, we had a three-year-old, a one-year-old, a newborn, and then it all kind of ramped up. And what you can't see when you're in it and it's chaotic and there's a three-year-old yelling at you and you think this situation is going to last forever and I, and I just can't deal with forever. You can't see mm. that it's going to change because of the stress of the situation. And that can be when people start to crack uh, from the stress of it. And so what, what I would do is I, I'd be like, hey, I really need one or two nights off from that every week so that I can just deal with it as, as yeah. we move through this situation as a couple. And I really avoided situations where we would get tired together. I didn't see that as bonding or, or much fun. I was like, look. Well, like what, what's a situation like that look like where you would get so, tired together? Uh, I, well, I'd take all three kids away and I just deal with being with all three kids. So, so you're saying you would go away by your, like that, going away w just with the kids leaving one behind the spouse behind helped yeah. you the other one get refreshed the other one gets tired you're not both getting tired together that's it's moments like that yeah as you know it's it's mm. it's it's like we are in the most challenging period of our marriage right now with these little kids around and we need to consciously rotate ourselves in and out with the kids using caregivers as well on a schedule that works for the kids and works for us, and we don't get ourselves in a position where we start blaming each other for a situation that's difficult in itself. If you get mm. too tired, you're gonna to start to blame your partner. And, and it's not productive because if, if your partner goes, your situation can get a lot tougher. It doesn't, it doesn't get easier. And so it's about bringing in more help and using the help effectively with the kids. Um, but oftentimes I think the, the moms put excessive pressure on themselves. And, and one of the things I find is this concept of, well, there's two things. One, you want to stay back from the edge. You want to stay well back from the edge. And what's the edge? The edge is the point where you break and you snap at the kid. Um, 
And, and that's not good for you and it's not good for the kid. And you don't want to create a habit of breakdown um, because the, the more often you do something, the more likely you're, you're to do it again. Yeah. So that's, so it's staying back from the edge. The other thing is, frankly, it's a negotiating tactic that's very effective with somebody that might not want help and that you, 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 if somebody's not willing to take help for their own situation, you don't make it about them. You don't, you make it about the situation and you can mm -hmm. use it in a lot of different, uh, environments. Uh, you can use it with somebody that doesn't want help in their personal life and you can make it about, um, the larger, a, a larger issue. It's like, well, you know, it's not really about you. It's more about the entire family dynamic here. And, uh, you know, your, your kids and, and this is, it can be a big motivator to change the approach. I mean, and, and I found that as well. And then there's looking very deeply to what you're going to value later. And one of the, mm. I, I've, I've known, uh, well, uh, three, four, I've known five generations of my family, including myself, because I was the firstborn of the firstborn of the firstborn. And they were all having kids young until me. And and I've I've seen a lot of lives from basically middle age through to death. And I've been able to learn from that experience about what we might value later. And, and you don't need to see too far ahead. You can only, you know, if you can see 10 years ahead, you'll be able to uh, adjust your life um, hmm. appropriately. And one of the key things that we will value later is a, is a strong marriage. And so in this really stressful situation, I was like, okay, this is stressful, but I got to get my marriage through this situation so that I can get to the good part, get the payoff in terms of the return on investment. And we're going to do this together. We're going to go through this very difficult situation. It's going to actually bond us together. But to get through it, we're going to need some help. And I needed to get my wife on board with the help because initially she was not on board with the help. So uh, she wanted us to try and figure it out together. And I knew that I had a limit of how much I could give to the situation. And I saw yeah. and I felt that she was a little beyond her limit. So I wasn't in a position where I thought it would make sense for me to give more. So we had to bring in this outside help. And, and it was just to take the pressure off so our kids got a better version of ourselves. And one of the best things we did was in Boulder, there was a preschool that is a really good environment for young kids. And they go through a three-year program that takes them from round numbers about two to five years old. And they have the same teacher the whole way through. And it's just a great mm. environment. And something I tell people is, you know, in your, in your mind, if you want to, if you want to do something for your kids, really do it for them when they're five and under in that period of their life, give them yourself, yeah. help them become really great people, great little people. And, and that's where you get a much bigger bang for your buck than spending a ton of money on college or private school in terms of yeah. what the family system will get and what that individual will get as a person. That's where you invest. And so my choice was to invest time in that period of my kids' development and to invest money in the sense of the childcare and the early education. And so that's how we uh, approached it uh, as, a, as a family. The successful among us delay gratification. The successful among us bargain with the future. That's a quote from Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. As I was having this conversation with Gordo, I couldn't help but to notice there was this recurring theme in his life. He seemed to have this innate ability to shift his focus on what he needed to become instead of living in what he had already achieved or had already became. You know, he didn't seem to be holding on tightly to this identity of being this elite athlete. He was willing to relinquish that and he traded that to be, let's call it an elite dad. And I just admired so greatly his ability to see ahead and gamble on what's possible if he makes the right sacrifices today. And so I wanted to know what creates a mindset like that in him. 
if you pay atten attention to where the satisfaction is actually coming from in your life, it's, it's knowing that you're working towards mastery in a particular area of your life, for me, is very satisfying. Mm. So whether that mastery is learning how to put together a financial transaction in a private equity situation, you become a master at that. Or mastery is learning how to do all four strokes and flip turns and be a master in the pool or at a triathlon or as a distance runner. You're working towards that um, can be very rewarding. And, and I kept some of that in my life when I was focused on the family. So I got into skiing when the kids were a little bit older and they could ski with me. And I worked at trying to become very good technically at that. And that gave me something that didn't take as much time that I could do at the same time with the kids. And I could get some feelings of satisfaction from that. And it got me through the period. And then the kids grew up. I could actually, now what I'm really doing is I'm going back to how I wanted to live my life when I was living my life purely for myself. And now I'm mm -hmm. bringing some of that back in, but at the same time, I have this successful family situation around me. So it's important for me to remember to maintain the gains I've built in the family system. I think if you, if you let too much of yourself go, and I've seen this with some of my friends over time when, when the relationship has this sudden break, they let, you know, they, they let too much of themselves go and all of a sudden one day they go nuclear and the family just blows up. Yeah. And, 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 and I think it's important and it's, it's that whole concept of staying back from the edge. You got to keep enough of yourself and enough of the marriage in the family with the little kids that you can get through the difficulty and get back to this point that I've arrived at over the last couple of years where I'm getting some time back into my life. I'm very motivated to see if I can get back to a very high level after this 10 year break I took to, to be with my family. And, and mm. all the signs are there that this is gonna be possible. I haven't done it, but it takes a long time to do it any, anytime you make a decision to, to get fit in a competitive sense again. And that's, yeah. that's something that's a lot of fun that I'm looking forward to is being able to document the journey and so I can have credibility when I talk to parents out there and I say, hey, you don't need to choose. It's a temporary, you're stepping back to do the right thing for your yeah. children and it's temporary. And then, you know, when it's, when your kids are a bit older and the time's coming back to you, you can bring sport, more sport back into your life. I'm not saying get out of shape. I didn't get out of shape, but I wasn't in competitive yeah. shape. And I was, you know, when we started testing me over the last year, we really saw how out of shape I was in a competitive sense. But as it comes yeah. back, I've been careful to document everything so that I'm able to have a very real conversation with people and say, look, you can get back to, to a level. Because I think many um, high level athletes, many very serious athletes feel like they're having to give up this core part of their identity when they become a parent. And you don't necessarily have to give it up. What I think is you have to pause it, refocus, and then bring it back. And I think that's, that's a powerful story that I think will, will bring comfort to many people because they're caught in this tension between holding on to their athletic um, identity and wanting to do the right thing for their marriage and their kids. The biggest thing for me to let go has been this all or nothing mindset. And I don't know if you have wrestled with that at all, but that's been a really big wrestle for me, at least. So there's, I, I can totally relate to the all or nothing. One of the interesting shifts that has happened in endurance sport over the last 10 years is a shift from focusing on the all, what, what's commonly mm. referred to as load maximization, to really thinking about, well, where are we, what are we trying to do here? What, what adaptation. So, you know, where are we trying to get to? So the seven habits of highly effective people many years ago was talking about starting with the end in mind. 
And we didn't mm -hmm. really have that kind of focus in our sport when I was at a high level. We were just trying to do a whole lot of work and hope that we got somewhere. And I think people do a much better job these days thinking about, all right, well, where are we now? And, and how, we just want to get incrementally better. So this focus on compound gains rather than going kind of this idea of going all in, getting totally exhausted and overwhelmed by the situation because we're committing so much to it. And so that's been a shift that's been helpful. Mm -hmm. And the, and also try, once you try that and realizing, well, actually I'm getting better and I'm not having to be completely overwhelmed here. This seems to be really working. You can bring this idea into other parts of your life. And it's really about the letting the compounding do the work rather than letting an exceptionally high workload um, drive the gains. So it's a, it's a different approach. So it's, it's, it's more letting time work in your favor as opposed to having to maintain a high work rate. Would it be twofold that you're probably having to let go of the high work rate and also the instant high measurable outcome or result? Well, yeah. I mean, that's the, that's, that's another thing with sport. That's a lesson from sport. Uh, you know, I question I get on social media is a lot of times is, you know, I've, I've, I can't see any difference week to week. And I was like, mm. yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it, you, you won't, you know, you won't see mm. a, a week to week. Yeah. And when you're, when you're new at something, you will see gains on a six week to six week basis, but it'll, it'll take, it takes months and years to fully get to wherever you're going to. And that's, that's why I like the thousand day time horizon um, yeah. idea, concept, because it gets people focused on, it reduces their tendency to overdo it at the beginning. And it also gets you focused on, look, this, is a, this isn't about just today. This is also about tomorrow. And it's actually also about next week. You can usually get most people to be thinking about today, tomorrow, and next week. And if you're thinking mm -hmm. about not compromising next week, it'll, you'll be more moderate this week. So it's about you know turning up, doing what it takes, but also bearing in mind you're going to have to back this up. Now, Gordo just mentioned something that I want to make sure that we don't just cruise over, and that is this thousand-day time horizon. This is where you pick something to focus on and you give yourself a thousand days to stick with it, roughly three years. And I had never heard of this, but it really stood out to me when I first heard Gordo talking about this on Rich Roll's podcast. And he tells the backstory of how he came up with this. And it was January 2001. He's training at the time with Scott Molina, who is a former triathlete, world champion, Ironman, uh, Hawaii champion. And Scott has decided to take on gordo as an athlete to train and he leans over to him on a on a ride and he says hey how long are you going to give this thing and then melina says before you make any decision i want you to give it three years and so that was where the thousand days came from you give it three years and you just see where it takes you and gordo <laughs> wasn't too sure he had three years in him but he decided to follow melina's advice and just two years into that is when Gordo goes on to win Ultraman World Championship. And Gordo says on Rich's podcast, it worked. And I pay attention to things that work. Now, I know this can sound trite, but I do wonder if too many of us are in too much of a hurry to reach a destination, to see results. And when we don't either see the results that we're hoping for or they're not happening quick enough, we quit too soon. And I love what Robert Collier said. He said that success is the sum of small efforts repeated day in and day out. And as I'm sitting here listening to Gordo talk to me and share his story, it was seeming to me that that was a vital ingredient in Gordo's life. What drives the decisions for you to to know that this is what a meaningful life looks like for me like did you ever sit down and just map that out or do you just have these values that you know you've created these principles in your life 
And, and as long as you stay aligned with those, it's creating that meaningful life. How does, how did that work for you to identify? This is a meaningful life. This is what I pursue. This is what I deny. Okay. So from a, from a very young age, I realized that the things I liked to do didn't cost much money. <laughs> and it was a, that is a very powerful thing to realize in your 20s. Mm -hmm. And it freed me from the chase at a very young age. Combine that with landing in a field where I was able to save a bunch of money in my 20s, the, the latter part of my 20s, gave me the ability to, to, to look around and, and, and just see what was going on. So that was, that was a great uh, realization. The realization was the way I'm wired, I like to do things that don't cost a lot of money. And mm. um, now, the other thing is, um, the way I'm wired is, I like to be working towards being world-class at whatever I'm doing. Fatherhood, husband, triathlete, private equity partner, um, student. It, it goes all the way, it goes all the way back to high school and maybe even before, maybe it was happening before I'm even aware of it. That game, that, that, that game of working thousands of days, compound gains is a game that I love to play. It's a project management game. And it's like, you know what? I'm just going to stick with this for a while and work with it and just go really deep on this one track. And I usually have one or two tracks that, I, that I'm sort of working on at the, at the same time. But you give, it, you give it enough though, right? You're giving it enough time to see what it feels like to see if it works, right? Yeah. And you get, and you, you know, life gives you feedback. You, you know, that life gives you feedback when you're on something that's resonating or where you have some capacity, it'll give you feedback. And I try different things. You know, right now I'm working on, you know, I got a YouTube channel that I'm, I, and I'm trying to learn how to do that. But I'm not going all that big on it. But it's, you know, I'm kind of just, I'm learning about it. And I'm going deeper with my writing. You know, writing three articles a week on the Substack and, and putting those out there. That's something that I'm working on. I'm working on the athletics. And I'm keeping the rest of my life going as well. But there's a lot of things that I don't track into. So I, I, I like to focus on, I like to go really deep on something where I can feel like I'm making progress. And that sensation of feeling like making progress is rewarding to me. But at the same time, I don't take it too seriously because at, at another level, all any of us is re are really doing is connecting with each other and passing time. And that's at a, mm. at, a, at a deeper level. So you you don't you know you it's it's easy to take the game too seriously, and and I think that can inhibit uh, well it can certainly inhibit creativity, but it can also in inhibit the enjoyment of the game. And I think what I found in my elite career was when it shifted from enjoying the process towards beating a particular athlete, a lot of the enjoyment went out of it when it got too competitive and it got too much about being externally driven a lot of the joy went out of the process whereas in those mm. early years and in the middle years of my elite career when it was all just about doing the work and having fun and challenging myself very rewarding years mm. um, in my athletic life you don't need the external competition to have the joy of mastery you can you can know you're making progress when you're just you know you're working against yourself. That's what makes the Ironman as a distance and ultra distance actually so rewarding to people, is they yeah. know they're overcoming themselves through the journey. So through the training and then ultimately through the event itself, they get this tremendous feeling of having overcome uh, themselves, and it, it's rewarding. But you you know those. Those feelings are available without actually signing up for a race. Sometimes the race mm -hmm. can nudge you into creating a lot of stress in your life if you're if you're getting out maybe in, in front of yourself. And I think you yeah. know one of the things I'm enjoying with coming back is very much the gradual nature of bringing myself back up, and I'll race when I'm ready, and and not rush it for myself. Just enjoy it. Did you ever have days that were dark for you, where 
you knew what you're doing is worth it, but it felt like hell. Like it, it was, it was tough to let go of the identity of who you had become to take yeah. on this new role. Did you ever have dark days go, making those the right choices? Dark years, Justin. Okay. Years. I had, it was the most difficult period of my life, hands mm. down. That being in constant noise and struggling with just getting yelled at for no reason I, triggered me very deeply. I had a childhood where at times my house was very loud and I can't remember if somebody was yelling at me or if it just happened to be a, a loud place. But I struggle with noise. And yeah. even now with a 10, 11, and 14-year-old who are fabulous kids, when they're having fun and enjoying themselves, I'm getting stressed out. And I got to go for a walk because I'm like, there is nothing wrong here. These kids are getting along. They're having fun. But the noise impacts me so much. I was like, I got to get out of here. And look, right on my desk, I got like, these are for running a jackhammer. I got like ear protection <laughs> in case I start getting like fried. So yeah, there was, okay. there were some really tough times where I felt like my adrenals were totally shot, like just wrecked. Yeah. So that was, so with the little kids, it was tired. It was more fatigue than dark. And, you know, what I would come, what I came back to was just, you know, stick with it. Don't retaliate. Don't act on anger. Those are those, you know, I would just say those things to myself again. You know, you don't want to make a habit of acting out. So you have to, you have to make a habit of just taking it and not yeah. wanting to be right and just dealing with the situation. And you're going to, I mean, three-year-olds are great for that. They'll get you past all kinds of issues if they don't crack you. So, so that yeah. was great. Now, in terms of the darkest period of my life, it was probably coming out of the pandemic, um, 2021. And I think after that first year, we were all expecting our lives to get easier and expecting our lives to get better. And it didn't. And it was the expectation, I think, perhaps, um, that, that made it so difficult for me. And that, in the sense, that darkness, that, that awful year was really helpful because that's what gave me the nudge to get back out in the world, to get, to get connected to people again through social media, to bring new things in my life, so try out some new stuff, and actually to go back to a little more, bring in a little more of myself go back to a little bit more endurance. And the idea was to really just to get back into shape and start doing some swim bike run. And I had a number of false starts. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like I came back and all of a sudden everything's rolling. I mean, I had, I had months where it was like I had all these niggles and things weren't quite working out. But, but I could see that sort of things were, were coming better. And then yeah. you get the positive feedback, you know, the, the compounding gains – I, I figured if I could get four new followers a day on Twitter, I would, by the time I turned 60, I would have enough followers to have a little consulting business, which is what was in my mind, was maybe get back into coaching. I wasn't sure what type of coaching, but I gave myself seven years to do it, to build up to the point where I could get into a consulting business, which I would be a nice little thing for me to do when the kids are gone. And then what I found was I paid attention to where I was connecting with people and I sort of doubled down on that. And that ultimately led me into the book I'm writing and the two substacks I have now, which have been very positive for me, very engaging, but also they give structure and they let me feel like I'm helping people and connecting with people, which is a big part mm. of, I, I guess, um, not so much happiness, but maybe life satisfaction. Yeah. I'm listening to you talk about navigating all these things with kids and, and, and letting go of things you love. And I'm like, man, I'm putting myself in your shoes. And I'm thinking I've had some dark days where I'm, I'm like, this is really, really hard. Uh, and Iron Man would be easier right now <laughs> than, yeah. than the, the choices I'm making, you know, in a lot of ways. And, and so I, I just, I kind of had a feeling your humility came from, being defeated, not just from being on the mountaintop. <laughs> In the 
book Parenting from the Inside Out by Dan Siegel and Mary Hartzell. They wrote this, when parents don't take responsibility for their own unfinished business, they miss an opportunity not only to become better parents, but also to continue their own development. People who remain in the dark about the origins of their behaviors and intense emotional responses are unaware of their unresolved issues and the parental ambivalence they create. Now, Gordo and I, we chose to close out this conversation talking about legacy and something that I would call the evolution of generational values. In fact, this was important enough to both of us that we had already wrapped up the interview, we were done recording, and it was later that night that we made a decision to jump on another call the next day to continue this conversation. I think the, my, my most valuable legacy to the kids is actually what I didn't give them. And let me explain that. So it's, a, it's like an anti-legacy. Hmm. And what I mean by that is when our first child was born, I was 39 years old. So to start the explanation, let's go back 20 years before that. So I'm 19, I'm living in a frat house. And the values we have at 19 are the values that have been taught to us and transmitted to us from both sides of our family. It's come in. So there's a lot of multi-generational stuff that comes towards us. And it, not all of it's good. I mean, sometimes in, in some families, there's some pretty challenging stuff that comes down towards us. And that has to deal with, has to do with the issues that our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents dealt with in their own lives, particularly if they had difficult childhoods. And my mom had a very difficult childhood. Um, and, and she did a great job with me. But my, my, her, her parents were, you know, they, they, did, they didn't do a particularly good job in their, in their situation. So I'm 19. You have this set of values that you've inherited and you go out into the world. And in my early 20s, you know, I'm living these values, and, and but they're not my values. And as I get to Asia, as I'm promoted, I get to my late 20s and I get divorced. And I have this sort of moment where I'm like, you know what? I'm I'm not living my life. I'm I'm living this set of values that I inherited. And I'm good at my job, but it's not really what I want to do. And so the, my 30s were really a process. It took a long time to figure out who I want to be, the kind of person I want to be. And in figuring that out, I changed myself enough to attract the sort of woman into my life uh, like Monica, like my wife. And so then we get, we're married and, and we create our values, the values that we have in our marriage. And then our daughter comes along and then my son and my next daughter. And so now I'm in my, my 40s and I've figured out my values. But as a family, we create these family values together at, in, our, in our home. And the value of this to the child, as the child grows up, it's, it's, it's similar to what religion gives many of us. It gives us a set of proven traditional values that have helped many people over thousands of years. And what we did as a family is we, we built our own values and then we've, we've sort of handed this structure off to the kids. And so the kids, when, when they're 19, they're going to have a very different set of values that they've inherited and been taught from Monica and I. And so that is something that I think is incredibly valuable. So for the people listening, you will have had challenges when you were young. You've had challenges in your life, but your challenges don't necessarily need to define you and define your, your legacy. You're completely free to change the way you want to live and, and, and have a new set of values that you can bring into your own life. And if you're a parent you can, or a grandparent, you can pass into your family and redefine uh, that. And so in terms of a legacy, that's really what I hope to pass. And in passing that 
to my kids, that can be an incredibly durable legacy. And how do I know that? I know that because some of the negative things that were taught to me had have a hundred or more year history in my family coming down towards me. As I mentioned earlier, knowing the many generations, I can see these things play out over different in, in each generation until somebody decides, you know, kind of puts yeah. their hands up, says, you know, this isn't for me. I'm going to break the chain. And in breaking the like chain. Like it stops with me, right? Yeah. It's like, I don't need to play this game. Yeah. I can redefine the game uh, and play it, play the game I want to play. We're not here to raise our kids to be us, right? And so even in listening to you talk about the gift of this legacy, one, it's stopping the negative in the generations that has existed. I have plenty of that in my family too. And my dad made a decision to to stop that. I've improved upon it. I feel like we approve generationally that way. But also you're giving them the gift of here's your foundation, but now you get to create your own. You're not telling them this foundation is what you have to always keep per se, is it? No, no. Every generation, every generation has to make it their own. I mean, they, yeah. they have to decide and it's, and it's more than just a generation. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm raising effectively, I'm having an influence on three families right now yeah. um, because each of my kids is going to define their own life and siblings will decide to live differently. They, they won't. So it'll uh, hopefully some things will rhyme kind of, or, and be similar between uh, these families that'll form, but it's up to them. And, and, you know, that's, and, and honestly, you know, I'm kind of looking forward to that. That'll be a phase of my life where it's not up to me. I've, I've done what I could and I'm handing it off. And we talked about, you know, you reestablish a relationship from an adult to adult basis as opposed to a, a parent to child basis. And it, it'll be two adults relating to each other and just going through life. And I'll be different, too. I mean, that's another thing. You know, you get older, you can really see the shifts in yourself over each 10 year block of your life as you as you change and as life changes you. That was such a meaningful conversation for me to be able to have. I hope that it was for you to listen to as well. Gordo, thank you so much. You can find links to connect with him in the show notes or you can find him on Twitter. He is on Twitter all day long and would probably respond as well to you. His handle is feel the burn one and that is feel the and then burn is B-Y-R-N, the number one. So on Twitter, feel the burn one. He also has two newsletters. One is for endurance athletes, and then the other one is fantastic for anyone. And this is about family and about wealth, and it's one of my favorite ones that I get in my inbox. Be sure to subscribe or follow the podcast wherever you're listening right now, or you can choose to find all of the episodes at fightforbrilliance.com. Thanks again to Gordo for being part of the show. Thank you to everyone for listening. And until next time, here's your reminder to fight for brilliance in your life today.